Hi, I'm James Verdeer, and welcome to the American Institute of Biological Sciences Bioscience Talks, which is a forum for integrating the life sciences. On the second Wednesday of each month, and often in between, we discuss the latest bioscience publications. And as a reminder, if you'd like to read more, point your browser to academic.oup.com forward slash bioscience. Today's episode is the next in our In Their Own Words oral history series, in which we chat with scientists who've made great contributions to their fields. Today's guest is Dr. Joel Craycraft of the American Museum of Natural History, Department of Ornithology. And as always, you can read along with the text version of these in the pages of Bioscience, and you'll find a link to that in the show notes. But for now, let's go to the interview. Dr. Craycraft, thank you very much for joining me today. My pleasure. When did you first know that you wanted to work in the life sciences? Oh, I, 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 I knew when I was in, in high school, I had a, a, a big love for biology. I had a uh, a phenomenally influential biology teacher up uh, when I lived in Sioux City, Iowa, who took took us out into the field, made us make collections, and so I got uh, really excited about that in the tenth grade, and I I knew that that's what I wanted to do. And what kind of collections were you doing in the tenth grade? Well, he had us looking at uh, parts of trees uh, and insects. Uh, so those were the mostly the kinds of collections he had us all do, and he he was a very hard taskmaster. He he did things that were really unusual. He would say, "Okay, uh, you need to look at thirty five trees. You need to get the buds. You need to get the leaves. You need to get the bark. You need to get the flowers. And if you get thirty five of those." Uh, all, all those p- parts of the tree for 35 of them, you'll get a C. If you want more than a C, you have to do more. And he did that with insect collections. He did that with going out and bird watching. Uh, how many birds did you see? And then you have to describe field notes with all of that. So you couldn't make, make a lot of uh, things up. And he got everybody out into the field. And he took people out into the field for midnight walks in the middle of February in Sioux Sioux City, Iowa, in a state park. You know, you you would be walking across the park by moonlight in the snow. And that's a big, big influence on a a number of uh, students there. I know a number of them ended up in biology. It sounds like it. Has it influenced your own teaching or mentoring at all? Um. Well, I I learned from him, I guess, that he was he was uh, uh, tried to be rigorous uh, with students in the in in what they were reading and thinking. His biology class at Sioux City Central High School, which no longer exists, had uh, uh, entry level college textbooks, and you had. For any particular subject, you had to read that subject in a number of books, and I, I think that instilled a, a, a way of thinking about uh, biology that may have actually grown uh, later on when I was a graduate student. I, I also learned uh, a, a lot of things as a graduate student that I didn't know as an undergraduate. That's fascinating. And, and just out of curiosity, how cold is it in February in Sioux City? Oh, it was close to 10 degrees, probably. <laughs> it was very cold out that night, but it was very crystal clear. And you could see everything without a flashlight because <laughs> it was a full moon. He picked it, he picked it pretty carefully. <laughs> what would you say is the biggest surprise in your career? Oh, I don't know. It's, it's, it's very difficult to talk about surprises uh, because there's all different kinds of surprises. I think one of the uh, best surprises was uh, finally deciding, uh, transferring from a wildlife management uh, uh, career at Colorado State University as a freshman, which was one of the really the best schools in wildlife management at the time to go to Oklahoma to be, to really f- uh, uh, work on zoology. Um, uh, 
that faculty there, that was a big surprise uh, to me, uh, the helpfulness of all those faculty members uh, being asked to uh, help uh, TA courses in, in my uh, second semester of my sophomore year and from there and on after. Uh, I, I mean, that just didn't really happen that much. I didn't expect it to happen, but all of that extra help that I, they gave me and I, I took advantage of uh, really was a big, big influence in my career. It's a big surprise for an undergraduate to do a lot of that at most universities. It sounds like it. What spurred that shift in focus? Oh, uh, basic sciences. Uh, 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 back Back then, wildlife management, if you were an ornithologist, it meant, it meant uh, uh, managing uh, waterfowl on refuges. And if you were a mammalogist, it meant, it, meant, it meant managing big game like deer and elk and moose and stuff. That just didn't interest me. The first year interested me because I did take a few basic courses uh, in, in botany and in other, in zoology. And I said, that's what I want to do. And, and so it was a pretty easy thing to do, uh, to, to jump. And then it was just finding the undergraduate program that I thought was going to serve me well. And Oklahoma was really close to where I lived at that time in Dallas, Texas. So it, it made some sense, but the program at Oklahoma was also very good. Another, if you really want to talk about a surprise in one's career, uh, as a sophomore, all, all undergraduates at Oklahoma in the sciences had to take a course in either the philosophy of science or the history of science, because they had a very stellar program in the history and philosophy of science. And so I, I took the history of science from uh, the 1800s to the present, which would cover uh, Darwin, and that's what I wanted. But I had a phenomenal teacher who, uh, 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 he was as important in teaching the students how to think about science uh, than he was he, he, teaching facts. In fact, he, 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 he would tell students, uh, uh, you can bring in all the books in the library to your exams and it's not going to help you. Because he didn't ask those kinds of questions in the history. He asked you more about the, how history of science works, how, how science itself works. And that was a very important formative uh, course in my career because it, it, it pushed me off into another realm that I uh, interacted with and published in, uh, you know, the philosophy of biology uh, for, for decades now. And I still, still do some of it. And it, it was like almost like a second career. And if I hadn't received a, uh, a, a fellowship to study zoology at Louisiana State for a master's degree, I probably would have stayed at Oklahoma and and majored in uh, 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 philosophy, history of science. And this next question may be less applicable for the philosophical side than the practical side. But you know, what are some big differences between the way that science is conducted now and the way that it was conducted when you first entered the field? Oh, it's it's exceedingly different now, by and large. Uh, when I the, the first 20 years of my career, it was mostly me doing my own work, writing my own papers. And now that's really hard to do. It's, it's a very different uh, field now. And uh, you, you may be looking at many of the same questions, but it, you know, it, it's, it's very genomic level, very informatics oriented now. And, uh, and, and really multidisciplinary in terms of having many people doing uh, little bits of, of big research projects. So back in, back in the 70s and 80s, I was writing about 
uh, Amazonia and the origin of the diversity there and, and bird evolution there. And, you know, was publishing with myself or a graduate student. Now uh, we, we've, you know, have a huge consortium of uh, many institutions in Brazil, North America, Europe, many graduate students uh, over the last seven years working on this problem. So it, it's just a very different way there, uh, of operating and doing science. There are still investigators, I hope I'm one of them, that will write some of their own papers and think about their own things. But that's, that's dwindling now. You know, a lot of, a lot of uh, scientists depend on the work that is done by graduate students, technicians in the lab and, and on computers. And yeah, we didn't have that, of course. When, when I was a graduate student, there were no, there was no internet. I was one of the early people at the University of Illinois because that's where the internet was kind of invented to get on the internet. And, and now, of course, everything is on the internet. Do you find that those innovations require a different skill set when you're working, you know, in the field or or when you're working on a project um, than it did? Because you know, obviously, being the being an investigator and you know writing all of your own work uh, is going to require you know a certain set of abilities and a certain set of work orientations and that sort of thing. Um, is it is it different now? You have to be a different t- type of scientist. Oh yeah, uh, I mean, if you look at the PhD students coming out now, or even 10 years ago coming out. Uh, they're way more trained in uh, 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 informatics and computer science, uh, uh, algorithms. Uh, they're very algorithm focused now. Uh, and, and they're very uh, large data set oriented now, genomics rather than but I've had I've had a graduate student recently doing phenomics, doing morphology, but but again creating very large data sets, and the students for the last decade or more have just just been trained trained differently. Uh, I was on a national academy panel uh, in which uh, it it addressed this exact same uh, problem: is uh, where is the professional? Uh, uh, scientists going now with big data and big analytics, and and it's very different than it used to be. Yeah, and that's something we've also focused on at AIBS and, and council meetings and, and the like recently. Is you know, do we have the biological workforce that we need, um, you know, to to meet the technological innovations that we now have? Yeah, you know, I we we addressed that when I was on the board, and and. My feeling is that it, to, to a certain extent, that question is trivial in the sense that there are so many people out there looking for jobs. Uh, I'm reviewing packages for a professorial appointment now at, at Columbia University, and they're all well, well, well trained, and, and they, they've developed a lot of skills. The other way that question is not uh, trivial is the fact that these fields are expanding like crazy and it's everything that students can do to keep up with them. And there will be new challenges. Uh, uh, Evolution, the, the study of evolution, the study of biodiversity has expanded tremendously and and whether you're an ecologist or a systematist or you're a behaviorist, you're confronted with all these new technologies and new ways of analyzing, collecting and analyzing data. So uh, on the one hand, I think you know, a lot of students are meeting those challenges uh, at, at many universities. Uh, and then a lot of them aren't. And, and it's it's those have nots uh, in some ways that we should be worrying about because it's it's like it's like the e- e- economic pie you know where it's really top ended 
And I think universities are that way too. It's very difficult for even good universities to keep up with all of these, um, uh, th this expanding uh, uh, web of science that, that's going on. That's interesting. So that would be a case in which you wanted to make sure that the ability to deal with all these new tools is disseminated, you know, more broadly among research institutions and individual researchers. Yes, it's 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 more than tools. Uh, you know, it 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 seems to me, and I I, I don't know, I, I'm I'm maybe prejudiced about that, but it seems to me that there's more emphasis on all of the analytics and gathering big data than there is about thinking about questions. And we, we tend to be using a lot of the new data and new analytics to answer the same kinds of questions that we did before. So that would speak perhaps uh, to, you know, a revived role for, you know, philosophy of science type questions, perhaps. Well, I try to teach some philosophy of science in my classes because I think it helps them uh, uh, think better. Uh, uh, you know, scientists, scientists have to learn how to think. And it was going to one of the very early OTS classes in Costa Rica where I was exposed to really first-rate scientists there teaching those classes because they had a fair amount of money uh, and it was inexpensive to go to Costa Rica then. And so you had people like Dan Jansen Jose Saracan, who you know is was the rector of uh, UNAM in Mexico City and a member of the National Academy, and we had really good instructors, and they they taught you in the field how to ask questions about what you're seeing in the field, and I I thought that that was a very different thing than I I had been taught in all the ology courses that I had taken. Uh, very few uh, teachers uh, uh, tried to challenge uh, students on how to think about what they're doing in those courses, what questions they're asking. And that, that OTS course was a very fundamental course in my, in my life too. Yeah, that sounds fascinating. And I, I wonder also, um, you know, pivoting a bit in the direction of talking about professional societies, if there might be a role for professional societies as well in fostering that sort of uh, expanded thinking and, you know, asking the right types of scientific questions. Um, oh, oh, to be sure. I mean, most professional uh, uh, societies have journals and they can easily promote this kind of stuff in their journals, and many of them do. I mean, I mean, uh, AI, uh, AIBS, uh, Biosciences, is a phenomenal cross-cutting journal, and there's many fundamental papers that are that are published in there that get very highly cited because they help people think about. Uh, many of the questions that they're interested in, 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 in different ways. And I think most, most societies promote that at their meetings. They, they may have debates at their meetings over important scientific questions. Uh, I've met lots and lots of really stellar undergraduates at meetings that go on to, to become really, really great scientists. And, and we all started that way, uh, you know, all went to meetings either as undergraduates or very beginning graduate students, and those were formative. So societies play a huge role in developing uh, uh, professional biologists, and, uh, you know, they, 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 they pump a lot of money into student research, too. I'm, I'm wondering... Um... What kind of role have professional societies played in your career? Uh, I and mean, that could be go going back from when you were an undergraduate to obviously leadership roles later on. Oh, uh, all of them played a role. Uh, you know, I, I, I was a, a, a junkie for societies. And I joined ornithology societies really early. I joined evolution society. Uh, systematic zoology, when it was, when it was systematic zoology, the Society of Systematic Zoology, 
uh, you know, the American Society of Zoology before it changed its name. Uh, I was I was involved in a lot of those societies because I found them just intellectually stimulating uh, from the standpoint of meeting people, but also of meeting people that were not necessarily doing the same kinds of things that I was. And I think that that was really important. Um, and so they've been, they've played a, a major role uh, in my career. They, uh, some of those societies funded me to go to the meetings. Uh, and and I, I think that you you build relationships because a lot of the people I was were, was the class I was graduate students with, they may have been at University of Michigan, I may have been at LSU, or they may have been at Kansas. Uh, that's where we got to know one another, and and we've known each other for decades, and and so those kinds of things for undergraduates and beginning graduate students joining societies is really important. I think. Yeah, absolutely. I guess while we're on the topic of societies, uh, do you have any particular favorite stories from when you were, you know, working with the IBS either as president or on the board? Well, I, that was one of the biggest surprises of my life was to get a call from Gene Likens telling me I had been elected. <laughs> And and I had always been uh, uh, active with AIBS uh, because I, I I just liked the cross disciplinary uh, biodiversity focus that AIBS has had for a long long time and organismic biology focus uh, that they've had and and I and I always appreciated the broad kind of papers that they published and papers that were going to be accessible to a person even outside your you know very specific field uh, I was kind of fortunate as an undergraduate and a graduate student to I took a lot of ecology courses and and the course that it really affected my career at OTS was a tropical ecology course and and even though I was interested in historical bio, bi, biology and systematics in particular, history of life in particular, those, those broad perspectives uh, have just really, really made a, a difference on, I think, the way I think, hopefully the way I teach, uh, and, you know, and the way you know, I interact with people outside my own discipline. Uh, I think one of the things that developed in the, uh, particularly in the 80s and the 90s, uh, was uh, this kind of balkanization of, of some of the life sciences, mostly because of, you know, the big competition for uh, funding at, for those sciences within, say, NSF, and and that was a that was dismaying. Uh, I understood it for sure, but I, I uh, and I, you know I think it still goes on. Uh, but uh, uh, I think a lot of scientists now go beyond that. Not enough. I th that's why I think ABI AIBS is really, really important. They can cross uh, uh, these disciplines like professional journals normally can't. No. Yeah, so that being both the challenge and the value of an organization like that is, is trying to bring diverse groups together to, to discuss and, and work on problems. Um, but it's also hard, of course, because it's... Yeah, it's very, very difficult. And AIBS is unique because of its position within the policy arena of Washington. And uh, there are certainly some individual societies, ologies, uh, uh, that do also uh, care very much about it. But AI, uh, AIBS plays a singular role in being able to network with all the other sciences to to really 
uh, promote science. You have to promote science at the high level and then at the biology level, then at maybe at the organismal biology level, and then, then down to the you know, systematics, ecology, population biology level. I mean, you, you, you have to really try to find support at, it, at, at, at a lot of different hierarchies within uh, Washington and the funding. And one of the things that you learn from working with a AIBS is that uh, it's really difficult to do things off on your own in a place like Washington with funding and everything. Uh, the, science, the scientists have to speak with a common voice and biology has to speak with a common voice. And, and then the societies that are, and uh, uh, organizations that are members of AIBS have to speak with a common voice. No, that's a great point. And I think that's, you know, the kind of thing that we try to say ourselves when we're trying to describe ourselves to new members. Let's uh, move along and talk about some of those individual day type of questions. Do you have a most challenging day that you remember particularly from your career? Well, obviously, 9-11 was a very challenging day in, in, uh, for the museum and the days after that. Uh, I, I don't think this institution or me as a professional has had, uh, and as a person, has had more a challenging day than uh, that week, indeed. Uh, and it, it created all kinds of problems for, for obviously for New York and New York institutions. And it you know went on for a long, long, long time. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I, you, there are day-to-day -day challenges of one thing or another, but but you know there there's no question nothing matches that, uh, and and I think being a New Yorker uh, on those days, uh, you know, and I live up up here on the Upper West Side, and and indeed I had come back from Washington. I ha had been down at, uh, in Washington. Uh, I think at a, at a meeting at the National Academy, or it may, uh, I'm not, I don't even remember, that day was a, just a blur. And I got kicked out of the National Zoo that day and came back, caught one of the last trains out of Washington to get back to New York. And, and, and then you arrive here and of course the museum was closed, everything was just a mess. So that's the most challenging day anybody could have, unless you were at ground zero down at Washington. And I watched ground zero from a couple of, of hours before I could get out of the town. It, it was bad. You know. That does sound incredibly difficult. I'm, I'm actually kind of surprised that anyone was able to make it from D.C. to New York on that day. Um, making a 180 degree turn, though, do you have a best day on the job that you recall? Well, uh, yeah, there's no, there's just been so many best days, uh, you know, that on this job that it's, it's just hard to pick them. Uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's a wonderful thing to be working at an institution that takes uh, uh, education at all levels so seriously. And we've been you know, we've been at that for decades now, and, and it's a big, big part of what we do today. And I think my best day on the job was coming here. The very first day was my best day in some ways, uh, because uh, it, it opened many, many things to me back in the early 90s that, w that w was not available, were not available at... Uh, at the University of Illinois uh, in Chicago. Uh, universities have gotten better at, 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 this, at this job of education, uh, science education, but I think most of them are nowhere near uh, uh, at a high level proportionately at what we can do at these you know, public institutions like the American Museum of Natural History. What makes the museums different? 
Well, we we have the best of both worlds. Uh, we uh, our curators are professors. We have graduate students. Uh, we have a, our own graduate program here at the American Museum that gives PhDs uh, in comparative biology and master's uh, degrees in earth sciences. And, and then also many of us have appointments at uh, Columbia University, City University of New York. We have graduate students from many different institutions around the area. and. And, and then we, we have this major education program if, at all levels. And so I do a lot of uh, uh, teaching to uh, uh, high school, middle school teachers. In fact, I'm revising an online evolution course that, uh, that uh, was designed for these teachers, and we have other tools that are designed. And that really is exceedingly different from most universities. Most faculty at universities don't have opportunities uh, to get down and work with high school teachers like we do here. And I think uh, that's that's very important. A lot of professors at universities do a ton of teaching at undergraduate levels, um, mentoring at gra undergraduate levels, graduate levels, postdocs, of course, and and they do a lot of really good work. Uh, I, I just think the breadth here was totally new for me anyway, uh, at, at being able to to reach docents people who explain to the public uh, uh, what the science of what they're seeing on the public floors. And we, of course, have the largest square footage of public uh, space in, in, in any museum. So it's, it's a pretty amazing place. Yeah, that sounds like a really broad diversity of, of types and forms of outreach that you can do from that setting. Um, any particularly funny stories spring to mind? Well, there's lots of funny stories and lots of weird stories. I started my life list of animals that have charged me when I was an undergraduate in Alaska when a grizzly bear charged me. And and that, that list has been growing ever since then from mole species of elephants to gorillas to mundane things like uh, deer, like uh, elk, moose, you know, weird things that, that that have happened. So that was a funny, it was a very tra traumatic day in that me and two graduate students almost bought the, 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 de the day then, but, but I look back on that as a <laughs> what a, an event that was, and it made me start a life list of the animals that have charged me. So there, I know it's weird. <laughs> no, not at all. That's 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 a lot of fun. Um, although I'm sure it wasn't at the time. It wasn't at fun, and it wasn't fun at the times. But you know, I've I, I've spent a ton of time out in all different kind of forests by myself. And with other people, of course, but by myself a lot, uh, because I just like being in the wild by myself. Uh, and and you learn from these experiences as undergraduates and graduate students that it's not you know being out in the natural world is is not a generally a, a scary place. Now, common sense rules that you'd be really kind of silly to walk across an African plains by yourself, you know. Uh, but um, uh, the, the, these types of events and taking all the kinds of courses I took and being out on the field in a lot of those courses was really good to, to see that the natural world is, is not a scary place. And frankly, most people think the natural world is a scary place. So 95% of all the Brazilians 
in the country have never been to Amazonia. They're scared of jungle, among other things. And I, I've, I've experienced that on many, many trips I've done for the museum with, with uh, 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 you know, patrons of the museum and with uh, people from the outside who sign up for, our, for many of our uh, tour, ecotourism trips. Uh, it, a lot of biology students are kind of scared of the outdoors too, you know. <laughs> And, 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 you, and it's, it's, it's normal. It may be normal, but you, and you have to learn not to be. And I think that's what biologists learn. It, they learn not to, to be terribly scared of the outdoors. And very importantly so. Uh, moving on, what event from your career do you think is most likely to be remembered far into the future? Oh, I don't know. You know, events are one thing. Uh, I, I, I think... I, I, I think you, what one hopes for is that uh, uh, some papers uh, last a while, uh, but I, I, I know enough from my own career and for, for looking at, at a lot of scientists over time and the history of science that, you know, it, that, that's, a, that's a tall order. Um, uh, you, you always hope that something that you wrote will still be either cited uh, 30, 40 years from now uh, and, it, and influence people. Uh, but one probably shouldn't take oneself too seriously. I mean, you have to take yourself seriously to, I think, to try to do good work. But... Uh, you know, no, no one event. I mean, I've had, I've had the luxury of having three or four or five really great graduate students that are, uh, have gone on and are going to go on to uh, great careers. Uh, that's really uh, important to me. Uh, and um, so th to me, those are the things scientists should be worrying about. You know, becoming world famous and all that kind of crap is is ephemeral because people that are undergraduates now don't know who the hell you are. You know, and and uh, unless your papers are taught or they are in your very specific discipline, they're not likely to do it. And and some of the very very best scientists who now say have been dead only twenty years, they're they're not as cited much at all anymore the, you know the fields passes by so it's 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 uh it, it's it's a very hard thing to say about any event uh that has much uh uh remembrance in in much into the future i think you may just be wrong about that one but if you were entering graduate school right now is there anything that you would study differently or any subjects that you would embark on that you didn't the first go around? Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a great believer in, in some ways in, uh, in the second law of thermodynamics, which kind of tells you that uh, things that uh, go on right now are predicated on what went on, but just before in some ways. And, 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 you know, and, and, it would uh, it would totally depend on what I did in high school. I think I had a very unique event. If I had taken a biology course with another teacher, my high school could have diverged. If I didn't have the ability to say teach various classes as an undergraduate. Uh, I think I would have stayed in biology, but it could have really diverged. Uh, and uh, also, you know, what school did you get, do you get into for graduate school? Uh, I had a, I had graduate school that I wanted to kind of go to, turn me down. And one of the other ones I wanted to go, Columbia, I, I couldn't, my career would have been completely different if I hadn't gone to Columbia. Because I arrived at Columbia when uh, Columbia uh, faculty were fighting over 
plate tectonics. They were fighting at the museum over methods of phylogenetic analysis. And I was right in the middle of all these very heated intellectual battles. You couldn't have been in the best, it was the best place in the world for me. And um, uh, so people, people, uh, so much has dealt each of us somewhat by accident. You, you know, ma many good students uh, can go to two or three graduate schools and they can have very, very successful careers at different graduate schools, but they're very likely to have different careers in some ways by going to different graduate schools because they all be exposed to different things. So I, I think the advice you can give people is totally be open to changing things and, uh, and to follow questions down uh, disciplines that are not your own by collaborations and so forth. Uh, it, it's, it, it, I don't think people can really plan their career except in a very general way. I want to be a college professor. I knew that when I was an under, basically when I was an undergraduate, that's what I wanted to do. But who could have thunk about the pathway my career has taken, you know? Uh, it, it, you, you just don't know. And I really it, it worry about students now because there's way fewer great jobs for the number of great students that are out there. And, and so I've just seen a lot of young people go in different directions than what maybe they wanted to go in. But I think the only advice you can give them is to keep your head down and keep your eye on where you want to go and make the best of where you are at the same time you're trying to do the best you can do to move on in a different direction. All, many of us have done that. You know, I certainly have, and and you just got to keep persevering. And I think that's a, a great piece of advice and also a great note to leave it on. Dr. Craycraft, thank you very much for joining me today. Uh, my very great pleasure, and my thank you for everything. And that concludes this episode of Bioscience Talks. Just a reminder, the journal Bioscience is published by Oxford University Press on behalf of the American Institute of Biological Sciences and is made possible by the support of our members and donors. Thank you, and talk to you next time.